we face long-term problems that like, will affect people over the next few centuries, and yet we've never been so short-termist. Richard is a senior journalist for the BBC and author of the non-fiction book, The Long View, Why We Need to Transform How the World Sees Time. We don't talk about the short-term is precious that exist, that, that they're invisible, they're subtle, they're hidden in plain sight. There are many paths ahead and we ought to be careful not to take the bad ones, but there are potentially many good paths too. Well, my guest today is Richard Fisher. Now, Richard's work spans science, technology, health, history and philosophy with a particular focus on stories and ideas about time perception with a long-term lilt. And he also writes an excellent newsletter called The Long View, a field guide, and I'll provide links to that in the description. To help us make inroads into this vast topic of time, perhaps you could begin by telling us what is your book about in a nutshell? So it's um, the subtitle of the book is, is why the world needs to transform its sense of time. It's, it's about uh, the idea that um, we we have a certain time view uh, that is built on our kind of culture, our kind of like psychological habits, the the world around us. But there are many other different time views that exist in the world. So there's ways that your time view can be shortened, but there's also ways that your time view can be lengthened. That's, that's my goal, to try show the ways that it's possible to become more long-minded in your day-to-day -day life. Uh, and also as a, a societal scale, how, how do we kind of build institutions and practices and norms across culture that have a more long-minded, long-view approach? Excellent. So there's sort of two dimensions to it in the sense that how do we view time individually and how do we handle time, think about time collectively as well. And so what was your motivation behind this topic itself and what brought you to researching and writing a book about the long view? Well, I, I've always been interested in long term thinking. I, you know, I, I did a geology degree back when I was a, a teenager. Uh, I also, you know, when I was at New Scientist magazine 10 years ago, uh, commissioned a special about the deep future, humanity's next 100,000 years. So it's always been there as a, as a kind of interest of mine. But I think what changed for me was uh, the birth of my daughter in 2013, realizing, you know, in the, in the sleep adult state that you are, you, ha you go through as a new parent, uh, that uh, her life ahead could stretch much further than I realized. I, I had a daydream where I imagined her living all the way through to the next century. You know, she'll be 86 years old when old Lang Syne and the fireworks go off on New Year's Eve. Uh, and and that, that got me thinking about, like, what our uh, generational ties look like, how far they reach across time. Uh, you know, if, if Grace, my daughter, can reach to the 22nd century, then, you know, how many generational leaps am I from the 23rd? You know, it's, it's only kind of great-grandchildren away that you we, we reach into the far future. And the same when you look back as well, right? So you can approach these kind of like world historic events, things that, uh, you know, the French Revolution, uh, the, the William the Conqueror and so on. You, know, you, you can look back uh, as, at them through the, the lens of history and date. But if you think about like your family living alongside them, only a few generations back, I find that these long-term timescales uh, draw a little closer. And so that, that was the starting point for me, the, the, the personal approach, uh, the, the, the kind of the link that we have with our, children and what who comes after us but then of course I'm, I'm a journalist and i also kind of write about the the, the future a lot uh, many of the stories though that appear uh in in journalism and reports that are produced by government and so on with the year 2100 which was kind of a, the date i was thinking about in terms of my daughter's future life tend, they tend to be quite pessimistic and quite negative and it's, it's usually sea levels will rise to a certain you know be, to take over cities uh, by 2100 you know heat waves will be across the planet and uh, many of them are climate change focused but there's also kind of like ai and robots will take our jobs by the by the next century it's it's, it's rarely kind of a a positive vision of the future so i also wanted to write a book that as well as tackling the the problems of short-termism and, and how and why we entered a kind of time blinkered uh, era what are the the kind of the ways that we can look to the future or futures plural with a greater sense of hope 
and, uh, and, and expectation that, that it could be better. Who's this book designed for? Who, who needs to take the long view? Well, I, I, I wrote it for people who uh, exist within their, their worlds of, for example, journalism, education, health. You know, I was, I was at the book's launch last week and many of my friends and colleagues came and they, they came, they come from all different walks of life. So many of them are journalists like me, but then some are, some are nurses, some work in, in, as teachers. Like everyone I speak to about the, the problem of short termism and the long view tends to see it within their particular sector. So I wanted to write a book about the principles and, the, the, you know, it, it should be for the people who see how short termism causes problems in the, the world that they live in, uh, both in terms of like the world of work that they operate in, but also kind of the broader environment, you know, through, through a world of climate change and so on. And, and, and be able to give them the tools and approaches to, to think differently, to take that back into the, uh, the, the places that they encounter others and approach the, the, the world with a different lens on, on time and to be able to see the future in their particular uh, space in their, their place, like with a, a greater sense of agency, autonomy, and and perspective. One point from the book where your thesis is quote: If all we can do is live in the present, dealing with ever more emergencies, blinkered to the dangers of tomorrow, it is a trajectory that leads to total collapse. You put it in pretty stark terms. Is this what you think is at stake? Yeah, I think there are, there are real dangers ahead. I mean, if you look at some of the the grand challenges of the 21st century many of them are slow mo moving long-term problems so climate change is the most obvious one but there are many others so uh, antibiotic resistance for example you know is, is a kind of slow moving kind of uh, problem in the medical and health world you know you can look at biodiversity collapse um you can look at uh, the, the the growth of ai and, and its kind of influence on on the way we work and live um, th there are many problems that are building up uh, very slowly, but they're big, they're challenging, they're problematic, and they, they operate over long-term timescales. And so the, the approaches that we have developed to think about some of the, the global problems that we have were developed in the 20th century. And I think the argument in the book is that we need new ways of, of approaching these these difficulties. In, in the book, I, I write about the world of politics, and, and business where you know the the approach that politicians take is obviously shaped by the incentives and deterrents that exist within uh, their world so most obviously the the, the length of term of a, of a of a politician is going to shape like which problems they're most willing to take on so you know the, the john claude juncker the the kind of like former president of the european commission you know, rem remarked after the um the kind of financial crash in 2007 2008 you know, we all know what to do, but we don't know how to get re-elected once we've done it. And this this problem faces all politicians. So, however, like as as the the problems pile up, if if one politician doesn't deal with a what I call in the book a slow burn problem, then they're going to get more of uh, more problems that are kind of like fast fires, the opposite end of the the, the, the spectrum. I mean, look at the, the pandemic, right? So. The, the pandemic is something that we we saw coming to an, a certain extent. We didn't know what kind of pandemic it would have been. You know, we didn't know what disease it would strike, but we knew that it was pretty inevitable that there was going to be a pandemic at some point in the future before COVID-19 arrived. And um, the question was, was like, how do we prepare for it? You know, how much money do we put into kind of measures to to, to deal with it? And, and then when, when the, the pandemic struck, you know, there was one uh, kind of crisis or, or fast fire after another. You know, there was the kind of the, the shortage of PPE. There was, there was Dominic Cummings in the, in the UK kind of uh, like creating political scandals. There, were, there was kind of like questions of were politicians like feeding funds into to kind of like their own kind of pet companies. It, it, there, was, there was one kind of like short term problem after another. However, there were also, there were also long term issues that needed to be solved, like how do we vaccinate people next year? And so my argument is, is, is that if we don't ha give politicians the opportunity to attend to the, the slow burns, then we're going to get more fast fires. We're going to get more crises. And so th there's a term that's been banded around at the likes of Davos, the polycrisis, the, the idea that we live in a time of con you know, 
connected crises where one kind of flows into another financial crisis pandemic crisis ukraine crisis cost of living crisis uh that's my fear that the the there is no kind of like single threat to to humanity that could kind of cause you know total extinction I mean, what well, there is but but the problem is is when all of, all of it comes at the same time when we face climate change and then we face kind of ai and then we face kind of like a, a kind of nuclear attack all, all, all these kind of problems could come at once and that's that's a problem which you know sometimes we can't foresee but uh the the, the preparation for it involves not failing to see the long term you know if you if we only attend to what's in front of us if we only live in the now then all we're doing is firefighting we're not kind of preserve, preventing the fires in the first place yeah okay and uh, I mean, interesting. You mentioned about uh, the World Economic Forum, because of course they they produce a risk report every year. They've published eighteen of them since uh, every year since two thousand and six. And this year they have had a particularly stark warning. They looked over the next ten years, which is unusual for them because they only usually use a look a couple of years ahead, and foreseeing an incredibly volatile period ahead, which kind of uh, uh, sounds very reminiscent of what you're saying here is that we're stumbling from one crisis to another and uh, individually it wouldn't necessarily be something that would uh bring down the curtains on all of us but it's the fact that they layer up upon on top of one another and it's them all feeding in at the same time and um, and so i i guess the, again going back to the book is that it's a call to action to even when we're in a, a situation of rolling crises, that we need to develop ways of stepping out of that kind of temporal perspective in order to start addressing some of the slow burners. Is that is that a, a summary, essentially? Yeah, I, th I think so. So what, what I'm trying to do in the book is, is identify s some of the pressures. So part one of the book, uh, I write about um, what I frame as uh, temporal stresses the, the kind of the, the cultural inventions, the external pressures that that foster kind of time blinkered short termist thinking. So I, I you know I look at the world of politics, but also business and, and society more generally. It, we've invented various different uh, kind of norms over the past 100 years or so that discourage a long view. So I, I mean, a, an example from the world of business is quarterly thinking. So. Around 100 years ago, the New York Stock Exchange started asking companies to report back to the market every quarter. And um, it wasn't compulsory at first. It took decades to actually really bed in. But that was a practice which led to companies more likely focusing on uh, short term kind of like pleasing shareholders rather than long term, you know, investing in R&D, infrastructure, environmental sustainability issues. So. These are things that are not in the world of capitalism that are not necessarily um, kind of in, inherent to how capitalism needs to work, but we've ad accepted them and they've become a norm. And so I, I would like the reader to be able to kind of like to navigate their own world, seeing what these pressures look like. So it, it's not just the world of business that there is all of us work in worlds where there are metrics, uh, targets that, that we're set either for ourselves or, or that others give us. That, that can either encourage a long view or, or not, according to short-term view. So you know, the, the historian Jerry uh, Muller calls it metric fixation, where or, or the tyranny of metrics, where certain incentives and, uh, are put in place, where if, if an individual follows them, then they don't, they don't focus on the long view at all. They just focus on meeting the metrics. And so that applies not just in business, but in politics, but all organizations have those. And so I would like people to be able to identify these temporal stresses and see uh, beyond the, the kind of what's in front of them to, to how things could be different. That's, that's the goal with the first part of the book. One of the aspects of the book is that you, you introduce the reader to how our perception of time has changed over time. Are there any sort of notable moments or factors in this evolution that really uh, transform the way in which we saw time and our place in it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, w one of the questions that I asked myself starting out in the project was, uh, how did past people uh, think about time in the future? And so uh, I, I set out to try and answer that question by looking at the Romans, people who lived in the Middle Ages. You know, it, there, are, there are various different 
kind of uh, it's, it's a big question. So you could write a whole book on this. So I, I didn't, I wasn't totally comprehensive, but you know, I tried to kind of like show, show how um, our time perception has evolved over over time. And so, you know, for example, the, the Romans uh, may have had a sense of the future in the sense that they could plan, but it was seen as something that was potentially more fixed and in place than the kind of the, the, the um, branching futures, the plural futures that we might see today. Um, in the medieval age, there was a, a more of a sense of uh, cycles. You know, the, the historians like um, Lucy and Holscher write about this period being one where uh, people saw time in terms of rise and falls of kingdoms, uh, seasons. You know, the, the idea that there was no sense of beginning, middle, and end. It was it was kind of things would repeat themselves. You know, also during this period, there was there was kind of like a, a well established. Uh, mode of long-term thinking uh, called cathedral thinking that was you know you can look back and uh, look at how people designed cathedrals back then they, they saw the, the cathedral as something that they that wouldn't be completed within their lifetime so you know they would start the project but then pass it the baton to the, the next person and this is in the present day this is often held up as kind of like a admirable long-term uh, approach um, however like it's worth looking at it in context because the people who lived um, back in, in you know, the 13, 1400s kind of saw time a little bit different to us. I mean, I, you know, I heard this from the, the researcher Martin Rees originally. He, oh, yeah, he'd just given a talk in a cathedral. And so he, he, was, he was telling me about like how the people who lived uh, alongside cathedrals tended to kind of see subsequent generations as living essentially the same life as theirs. There, was, there, wasn't, a, there wasn't the pace of change that we have today. Uh, where all all the kind of like the graphs of growth and, and kind of technology are, are kind of zooming upwards, uh, you know, you, people were able to kind of like look ahead to their children and think, okay, well, they'll probably still be building the cathedral because they'll have a life like me. And so this this sense of like time being relatively flat or cyclical kind of is extend, extended for thousands of years. What, what changed, uh, at least in the West, was uh, a kind of like a sense that time was much deeper than people realized. So around the 1700s, geologists uh, became aware that that there wasn't space in the biblical account of Earth for all the rocks that they were observing to have formed. You know, it, m it must have taken millions of years to, to have happened. And then simultaneously, um, there's what the, the historian Lucian Holster calls the discovery of the future. But many intellectuals in Europe kind of realized that if time extended backwards, over millions of years, and it could extend forwards too. So Immanuel Kant wrote about there being mountains and mountains of centuries that, that lie ahead. It hasn't been totally kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of expanding ever since. You know, this, I, I, a fluctuation is more more accurate. So as, as kind of there's been kind of crises and, and changes in the world since then, I, I you know, I would argue that the, the sense of kind of time has expanded and contracted. So during the, the kind of the French Revolution, which you know shortly followed this kind of expansion, discovery of the future, obviously people were more focused on the kind of the, the conflict in the present. So same with, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century, there was there was kind of like a, a blossoming of the future when, you know, the discoveries about radiation revealed that the sun might last longer than anybody uh, realized, you know, and, and writers like H.G. Wells were kind of looking ahead to like, a world with Morlocks and Eloy and, and the, the time traveler. Uh, you know, it, the, the, that there was an expansion then, but then, of course, the Second World War, the Great Depression, like happened. So, you know, our, our sense of time uh, can be shaped by external events, and so that that was kind of like the the kind of brief history of the future that I kind of put together in the book, showing how like the past cultures had different views uh, of time, but it was shaped by their knowledge, culture, and assumptions about the world. We talked a little bit about some of the roots and causes of short-termism and. Uh... And and you talked about how we organise and structure our world and make decisions collectively, and this this can lead to uh, more short term thinking. Um, and you touched on a couple of the temporal stresses. When you started uh, when you started looking at this and researching this, did it surprise you to find the extent the extent of these forces? I think uh, I had an inst instinct of what they might be you know so, so pe people talk about quarterly capitalism and the problem with the political kind of term uh, as an issue i guess one of the conclusions that i 
came to though was that there's many forms of short-termism that are kind of not even noticed or kind of discussed anymore you know they're, they're kind of framed as other types of problems so I, I tried to come up with a term that captured that in the book uh the, the term time blinkered because it because I, I wanted to be able to kind of capture the the the, the perspective that you can be short-termist without awareness and because because some short-termism can be good right there are times that we need to be present minded you know that we need to attend to, to crises or emergencies or at the opposite end of the spectrum to enjoy life's pleasures you know sometimes being in the present in the now is a, is a good thing uh, the, the problem that i kind of see is is one where we don't talk about the short-termist pressures that exist uh, within our societies enough you know that they're, they're invisible they're subtle they're hidden in plain sight and that that's the kind of the, the the kind of the approach that I wanted to take to help help people to be able to see them because there are there are many there's no single one no there's no silver bullet that we can uh, kind of fire to kind of to, to, to solve them all you know they're, they're kind of they're spread across society and so the, the, the aim of the book is to give you the tools to be able to see them and do you feel there's any uh stories or examples that really encapsulate some of that short-term thinking well in in the in the book i tell the story of the collapse of a bridge in minnesota so um about 10 15 years ago there was a very notorious kind of a bridge collapse uh that uh you know, you know, caused loss of life and, and also kind of like a, a great deal of disruption um and at the time it, you know it was kind of seemed like a freak event you know that a kind of a bridge collapse in america you know the kind of thing that you, you see on the news regularly but you know if you look deeper into the story you can see that there were decisions made decades earlier that led to it happening you know the the the, the shortcuts that were taken in the bidding process that the companies uh that the, and the organizations and politicians that decided to build the bridge in the first place that you know they, they, they didn't knowingly build a bridge that would collapse in the future but they also you can compare it directly with another bridge on the same river you know a, a few, you know a half a mile down that was built 50 years before that you know at the turn of the 20th century that's built out of stone and is still standing you know the, the that that was a kind of a, a much sturdy design the, the problem with this this bridge that collapsed um was that the the the, the kind of the, the gossip the, the uh, steel plates that were in between the the joints, you know, kind of like the finger webbing that you on your own fingers, that that just was just too thin. It was a design flaw, and it was the kind of thing that wasn't spotted. It also kind of like didn't matter too much in the short term. You know, it was strong enough at the time, and and so th th that's the kind of like major kind of news story that we see all the time. You know, that that spills out into kind of all sorts of consequences, but is is a kind of a, a, a long-term story too you know there were decisions that were made long before that that led to it happening and so that that i felt was emblematic of the short-termist kind of pressures that exist and those sort of decisions i guess there was uh, there was one quote you make of uh, uh francois hartol who, who mentioned about uh presentism and a fractured critical society, this idea that short-term decisions are taken that lead to huge costs down the line. And I guess they're most evident in decisions that are meant to last, things like infrastructure that you would expect to last for years and years to come. And those decisions, uh, I guess, brings us on to wider decision-making processes. How do we make decisions collectively through democracies? and? You talk about democracy's greatest flaw uh, in relation to uh, the temporal crisis or time crisis, the, the way in which we are time blinkered. When you say, when you talk about democracy's greatest flaw, what do you mean by that? I think I think it's it's something that is inherent to democracy. And, and to be clear, I'm not saying that we need to throw democracy out. It's not not that that kind of book. I mean, you know, it's it's more that the 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 inherent issue when you have to elect politicians every four years or every two years in the case of some U.S. governors is that that you incentivize those individuals not to look beyond the the, the four years. You know, so I tell a story in the book about 
um, a chap called David Stockman, who was part of the, the, the Reagan government back in the 1980s, you know, and he, he was given a mandate to, to kind of like make huge cuts across government, you know, and Reagan had asked him to do this. Um, but then he, but then he came across a problem that was that was long term in nature, kind of social security reform, pe pensions reform, and it required some investment. You know, it required him to say, no, we're not going to cut this. We're going to put some money into to this problem. Um, and he, he he gave an interview to a, an Atlantic journalist uh, that became quite notorious. Uh, you know, for his for its honesty, um, he he said to the journalist, um, I'm just not going to spend a lot of political capital on some other guy's problem in 2010, which at the time was, you know, 30, 34 years away. So I think that that sense that uh, you, 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 politicians are not incentivized to solve problems that don't benefit their own political careers is, is, is the inherent flaw. But that said, I, I don't think that like we, we should throw out democracy. It's more about having systems in place uh, that account for kind of like future generations, uh, account for uh, the, 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 the way that uh, politicians need to do things that that will uh extend beyond their their kind of like electoral term it's possible i mean it's been done before so i think i think it's it's about the whole system uh you know media business all the pressures on politicians like seeing that that what we ask of our politicians is it's not not just down to them to decide it's it's kind of the the framing and the, and the system that they operate in if we can incentivize and show that future generations matter then politicians are more likely to, to take that kind of view on board. It's quite interesting in the, you mentioned in the book about the discussion in the House of Lords about a possible future generations bill. And one of the, uh, one of the comments was that, uh, the, from one of the members, was that they were concerned that uh, we would be bringing in the concerns of people that weren't in the voting booth. And I found, I must admit, I personally found that a little bit puzzling because I guess people are bringing in the concerns of other people, either geographically or temporally, to the voting booth all the time. You vote because you perhaps care about foreign aid. Uh, you vote because you perhaps care about uh, your children's prospects or your grandchildren's prospects. And so, and then it got me thinking, is this about us as individuals changing our temporal horizons and being more mindful about the longer burn, the slow burn issues that are the critical issues that might not be fixed within the parliamentary term, but we need to vote on the basis of on those things. Um, is it about individuals changing uh, or is it more about introducing structural changes to democracy, changing voting ages or lowering them, for example, or introducing um, uh, future commissioners, uh, such as in Wales, for example? Well, there's certainly no panacea, you know, there's no kind of like instant thing that we change that will kind of transform politics and that there will always be self-interested individuals in politics and there will also be self-interested voters as well. So uh, I don't think it's very easily solved, a mixture. There, there are some people who are more activist focused than, than I am as, as a journalist. You know, I, I kind of document and write about these things, but I'm not uh, kind of, you know, lobbying for political change. But I, I think the taking the long view is, some, is a kind of collective endeavor. And I, and I see that it's possible for kind of institutional reform. Like I, th I think the Wales example, the F Future Generations Commissioner, like integrating kind of future generations rights and policy into kind of the decisions that politicians make is, is a good move but there is there, there's also more kind of uh kind of action that you know protest that, that, that can be done lobbying outside of politics so I, I don't think there's like one single uh opportunity but you know i i think i think that what's interesting is that the focus on future generations goes back quite a bit further than many people realize and, and you know the, the people politicians like john stuart mill you know more than a century ago were talking about kind of what we owe to, to posterity, you know. So it's it's always been there within within politics, and you know, in, in the 1990s, the the ocean explorer Jacques Cousteau, he was on the, he was on the activist side of things. You know, he was tried to get the UN to adopt a, a a bill of rights for you know, much like the kind of present day kind of activity in terms of 
introducing legislation. So th th this has been there. You know, it's just about harnessing it and, and connecting the communities and, and trying to kind of like bring them together so that everybody is pushing in the same direction. On the the point of democracy, clearly there's lots of different ways, avenues that, and things that could be tweaked and changed and considerations that could be made. Uh, and of course, there's not one single type of democracy in the same way that there's not one sim single type of capitalism. Uh, they can manifest themselves in, in, in different ways. And uh, I, I was wondering to what extent different electoral systems could have different uh, could incorporate a more broader think sense of of time, in the sense that uh, if 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 there was any difference uh, between first past the post system versus a proportional representation or those with uh, uh, written constitutions or not, whether there's uh, any sort of interesting uh, interesting dimensions to or, or characteristics of democracies size of the electorate, for example, uh, that could actually play into this, whether some more of the short termist um, politics and the and the more f at the more febrile short term end of the spectrum exist in larger democracies and whether smaller democracies um, perhaps are better able to build in longer term, longer term planning and longer term thinking. I mean, I mean, I think uh... I mean, one thing that speaks to that is, is, a, is a piece of analysis that the researcher Jamie McWilkin and the author Roman Kuznarek did. They, they, they created, uh, well, McWilkin created something called the Intergenerational Solidarity Index, where they tried to measure very, and compare various different countries according to how much they uh, showed awareness and care and investment in future generations. And so some of the measures were kind of things like forest degradation rate, whereas others were kind of pupil uh, teacher primary school ratios, you know, so lots of different measures leading to a kind of single number and ranking. And so they, they showed that the you can you can rank uh, democracies and also, you know, uh, authoritarian kind of uh, nations as well. Um, and so, so interestingly, the it wasn't kind of like the 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 US, for example, was like placed 66th, you know, in, in the world rankings, like up near the top, it was more likely to be, you know, Iceland or the Scandinavian nations, uh, which are usually best at most things. So it's kind of not a huge surprise. But yeah, what, what was what was striking about the analysis that Kaznarek pointed out in the book is that um, the, the of the 25 top ranked countries, uh, 21 were democracies, you know, so it wasn't necessarily the case, because some people point out that uh, a country like China might might be better placed to pl put long term uh, kind of plans in, in place because they don't have elections to worry about. Um, however, you know, according to at least according to these measures, uh, investment in future generations, like China, was down at twenty fifth or so, I think. So y it is possible to compare. You know, it all depends on how you kind of like work the numbers. But you know, I, th I think long story short, I think there's much to be learned by looking at nations that are not that are not necessarily the the wealthiest you know they may have kind of like uh, approaches and things in place that that allow for a kind of longer term view you know so like citizen assemblies that kind of in incorporate future generations for example is something that i think has been tried in a few places and that that could be kind of more widespread i think hmm. shifting the focus slightly uh to the role of technology as perhaps a cause of short termism is 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 that something that in terms of technology and its role in hacking our ability to focus and contemplate bigger long term projects individually do you feel that that in any way plays a role into uh creating the conditions for more short term thinking i think it can i i kind of made a decision not to spend too much time on technology in the book because there've been a lot of books written about how technology is shaping our attention. And I didn't want to kind of repeat ground that would all already be familiar to lots of readers. Um, so, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't dwell on that issue. I, I guess one thing I have been thinking about lately myself though, is, is how one's media diet can encourage a short or long-term view. You know, it, I, I think, I think we live in a time when information is ubiquitous and, and so much is real time, you know, but you spend all your time on Twitter, you are 
that's all you're doing. You're only sp spending your time in the now, what somebody tweeted in uh, of the past 24 hours. Same with news, if you only kind of like consume news. I, th I think there's an argument that news has become more dominant in our lives over the past 10, 20 years. You know, it, it's a kind of a daily drama when the president is being, you know, taken to, to, to court and, and tried as a criminal. You know, th these, these things are kind of uh, shaping our kind of sense of time as well. Um, I, you know, so I guess I'm trying to wrestle with that myself. You're trying to think about like, how do I uh, have a long media diet? How, how do I find patterns and trends that are not just about the past 24 hours? So in that sense, I think technology has played a factor. You know, there are there are ways that social media and the way that news is everywhere now that uh, are more likely to kind of keep us in the now rather than make us think about the long term. What do you think are the most intriguing neurological and psychological barriers to us, to our being able to take a, a longer perspective? Well, there are, there are many, so I'll, I'll just try to do my best to give a summary. I mean, the, f the first thing that I would say, though, is, is that we, we have a remarkable ability that's unique to human beings, uh, the ability to mentally time travel into the deep past and, and far future. You know, we, we can kind of transport our minds from this moment right now to imagine what we did yesterday, what we had for dinner, but then also kind of imagine our ancestors and our predecessors before zooming ahead to kind of think about possible futures branching off for us from tomorrow into the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. So th this mental time travel uh, apparatus in our brains is, is a, an incredible thing, but it is flawed. And so it can be shaped by psychology. There, there are ways that kind of like our habits and biases uh, shrink or expand our, our sense of time. So, you know, very well known ones are just that we have a bias towards the present, you know, so the, the, the marshmallow kind of test, which famously asks children to, to wait for two marshmallows rather than eat the one in front of us. So I think that doesn't just apply to children, it applies to adults too, right? So, you know, e eating the burger we know is unhealthy or, or failing to kind of save for retirement. All these things are kind of us discounting future benefits for the sake of the present. But there, there are many others. So, you know, I think uh, one, for example, that I find particularly interesting is the it's a psychological theory called construal level theory. And it's about the way that uh, psychological distancing and how our empathy doesn't extend over kind of well, literally distance, but it also doesn't extend over time too. One thing that the mind does is it entwines space with time. So when we talk about the future, a lot of the time the kind of adjectives, at least in English, that we use tend to be things like far or distant. Uh, so we, we kind of create a landscape in our minds where the future, the further you go, is further away from the self. Uh, the very far future is somewhere over the horizon uh, that you can't even see, a distant land. But of course, the future is not distant, distant, distant. It's, it's, I mean, our grandchildren will probably live in the same country as us, you know, if not the same city or neighborhood. So th th this way that the, the mind creates this kind of distancing effect, I think, is something that kind of applies to the way that we, th we think and make decisions about the future. I mean, other, there are other ones, you know, for example, there's one called salience bias, which is a, a way that we make decisions based on what is loud, local and urgent, you know, so we, we build these kind of like uh, paths into the future based on what we see around us. But the, the information you feed in tends to be kind of the way that you build those mental models. And if if that information is salient, say kind of like a, uh, a very striking news report, you know, it, it's so what I mean, to give you an example, there was a, there was a study after 9-11 which showed that people stopped flying as much. Uh, they, they, they drove more, right? So that, that, that kind of like has a direct impact. You know, the, the news reporting of 9-11 changed people's behavior, but it then also had a consequence in the sense that like, there were more road traffic accidents as a result because more people were in cars. Uh, the, the salience of something can shape our kind of like future perspectives. So that, that's, that's one. There's, there's many others. There's one called shifting baseline syndrome where it kind of like we can't see the changes around us because we've always they're too slow to see. I mean, I could go into more, but like I think uh, that that gives you just a taste of the way that the, the habits and biases that we have shape our view of time. As you're growing up, the world that you're born into shapes your world view, which you then take with you throughout your life. And so when you are confronted, perhaps in a, a position where you're decision making, perhaps as a politician and you want to instinctively um, do the right thing, 
your your mental model of the world is actually one that's perhaps 20, 30 years out of date and is no longer applicable. Is that a part of the psychological flaw? Is that something, a, a difficulty to, to see shifting baselines? Yeah, so that, that's, that's, I mean, so that, to tell the story of like how shifting baselines were first identified, it was a, a fisheries scientist, Daniel Pauly. He, he made the observation in, in his particular field that um, ocean scientists, when they looked at the, the kind of the seas, uh, were just accepting the, the diversity of uh, marine creatures that they saw as, as the norm. You know, the, the, the world that they grew up in was, that's, that's the way, just the way the oceans were. But, um, they, but then they kind of came, you know, Polly came across um, the story of a, a, a colleague's grandfather who, you know, one of the Danish seas used to kind of haul in like giant tuna, right? And, and used, they used to be a pest, apparently. They get, they get caught in, in nets. Um, and so, so that, that kind of story revealed to him that the, um, the, the norm that was accepted amongst kind of ocean scientists was not necessarily the norm that the grandparents knew. And so I think, and I think, I think it's a profound insight because that, that applies to so many different areas. You know, if you, if the world that you kind of like grow, grew up in is, is the norm, then it's, uh, it becomes kind of like something that you shape your future projections based on. I mean, in the, in the world of technology, there's a famous quote about, um, uh, I think it was Alan Kay, he, he said, Te technology is everything that was invented after you were born. And I, I think that, that insight captures the idea that the world is constantly changing. But, you know, I, I mean, the, uh, there are many technologies that we just take for granted. You know, a, a chair is a technology. At some point, someone invented a chair, but we don't consider that technology anymore. And so similarly, our children will kind of grow up in a world where they see technology very differently. I mean, the, the Internet is now just the, the waters that they swim in, not necessarily something that's brand new. Yeah, I suppose that idea of uh, of imagining how things will be in the future as well applies to things like demographics in terms of how you project forward and you imagine that, uh, well, if you've got a uh, set number of 40 year olds in 40 years time, you'll have a set number of 80 year olds. You can kind mm -hmm. of predict how many would wither away. And um, but of course, what's not factored into that is that they might have completely different uh, requirements or completely different uh, uh, patterns of behaviour and patterns of consumption that would change over time as well, perhaps. Well, yeah, I mean, this, this, is, this relates to something that you and I have talked about in the past, uh, so, something called the end of history illusion. The, the sense mm. that, so, so the end of history illusion is the idea that um, the way things, the way, the way you are now as a person, uh, you, you think, okay, well, I, okay, I've changed a lot across my life. I'm a different person to when I was a 10 year old, but like now I'm 42, or, you know, this is how I'll always be. But like th this, this, it's probably not true. You know, you probably, by the time you reach 70, you know, you can have different needs, interests, wants, you know, desires, like the, the, this, this sense that we're fixed in place is, is kind of, again, a psychological bias that shapes how we think about the future. You know, and I think if you apply that to a societal scale as well, then I think it's even more profound. You know, the, the, we can't assume that the, the norms of today will always be the norms. Look at the social change that's happened over just the past 10 years or so. So I, I think, the, the likelihood that our children will want different things to us and, and kind of aspire to different kind of uh, futures, I think is, is a very like discombobulating thought, but it's almost certainly true. So we've talked a bit about um, how the how time can feel geographically distant. Um, perhaps we move to how can we what are the tools we can use to draw it close? Um, in terms of tools to expand our perspective of time and through in the book you look at lots of different examples in cultural practices ethical lenses and artistic devices and also you talk about the, the importance of language and symbols i just wondered for you what were the the most powerful examples that you encountered i think i think from the research uh the 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 ability to kind of like perspective take is one of the most effective ways of encouraging uh, empathy and care across generations. So th th there, are, there are studies where people are asked to imagine the sacrifices and, and acts that, that made their life better, that were kind of, that, that their grandparents did for them. And then ex extending that kind of into the future, what what might you do for your grandchildren? It's basically the, the duty to, post to posterity. 
Um, you know, there's also kind of research from Japan where um, people have been asked to step into the shoes of citizens living in the 2060s and to, to actually role play and take the perspectives of, of those individuals. I, I think in terms of like actually shifting people's minds on the short term very quickly, like that, that perspective taking kind of exercise can be a very powerful thing. Um, there are, I mean, per personally though, what, one of the things that I find uh, very kind of um, uh, easily accessible and, and also something that, you know, that anybody can do uh, and can also kind of change your view is, is to seek out kind of like the, the examples of deep time in your neighborhood. Like the, the, the long view is everywhere if you look for it. Right. So, I mean, just to, you know, give you an example. I, I, you know, I live in Southwest London, and I, you know, I go to a, a park called Richmond Park every so often. Um, and what, one, until a friend told me about it, I didn't know that there were kind of uh, Bronze Age, like barrows, graves that, that that were kind of in Richmond Park that you can walk straight past and not even know was know were there. Similarly, like you know, when you walk on the the beach, you can think about like the sand. You know, between your toes, kind of stretching back millions of years, you can look up at the stars and think about how the light kind of travelled. Even in the city, you know, there are layers of, of geology sometimes, like beneath a, a kind of like roadworks. So, deep time scales are everywhere if we if we care to look for them. And similarly, like you know, I I, I find like thinking about the generations like the closest to me too. You know, when I, when I look at children and I, you know, and uh, like my daughter and think about like her life ahead that that just allows me to kind of extend the mind out of the present and so the, the, these kind of tools approaches uh things that are in the kind of the everyday experience of, of living a life in in 2023 are, are there to be found you know you just have to look for them in the first place trying to tie all this together um you, you talk about moving towards a deep civilization and I just wonder, could you tell us what, what is a deep civilization, and perhaps what would be the one or two priorities that you would suggest we start getting uh, started with to building it? So th this this is from the kind of the the close to the book uh, where I'm kind of drawing together all the different threads. So across the, the the final third of the book, I I look at the various different groups, organisations, individuals that that have a long-minded approach. So I look at the kind of the long-minded uh, kind of approaches within with the art. Uh, I look at science. Uh, I, I you know I, I look at kind of the worlds of philosophy and indigenous and, and religious uh, kind of approaches to the, the long view. And what what I kind of like saw from kind of speaking to all these different people were the kind of the seeds of something that, you know, th it, there are many different kind of long views out there. You know, I, I think I think if we only had one single long view, then I think it would be a, a, a pretty boring world. And, and also it wouldn't be, uh, you know, the future belongs to everybody. And so people should have the opportunity to feed into kind of like what kind of long view we developed. But like, so, so with, with the framing of the deep civilization, I was trying to show where we could be headed. So. You know, I, I don't know the exact details, but I, I've got the, 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 the broad contours are a kind of a, a world where we, we kind of we don't get trapped in short termism, where, you know, politicians kind of like do the right thing by future generations, where businesses have the foresight to kind of, uh, care, you know, do more than just like look at the interests of shareholders, you know, where, where we kind of like a, a approach big problems that we face like climate change with kind of like a long a long-minded view where, where the media you know I, I'm a journalist like where the media is is kind of more likely to focus on like long-term trends than kind of like just the daily kind of froth of the, of, of the news cycle you know it's it's a kind of a a, a, a way of framing all of the book's threads joined together you know I, the 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 long view is something that I believe could spread across kind of societies you know it doesn't necessarily need to be a singular kind of approach to like long-term thinking it, you know everybody should have its have their own kind of like approach to taking the long view but I, I wanted to kind of like frame what that world might look like and so that that's where the book ends up a, a world where kind of there is a sense of hope and possibility about about the future because because you know I, I started this project with the, looking at the problem, you know, the problem of short termism and, and a worry and concern about my daughter's future. But where I ended up was uh, a greater sense of perspective, autonomy, energy, hope and possibility about where 
the possible futures could, could lead us. You know, so that, that's what the long view gave to me personally, and that's what I want to leave the reader with at the end of the book. Do you do anything differently as a result of researching and writing this book? Are there any practices that you that you now undertake? That's a good question. Um, I think I think it's changed my uh, it's changed my media consumption a bit. You know, I think. You know, I I'm, I kind of have to be on Twitter because I'm promoting a book, but uh, I think I think spending a little bit less time on social media and more time kind of cultivating a long media diet, you know, looking at kind of like long-term trends that, that kind of that shape societies rather than kind of focusing. I mean, you know, I, I I've tried to integrate it into my work at the BBC, you know, trying to commission and work with writers that have a kind of longer-term view on the world. Um, it, I guess in my, in my personal life, it, I, you know, as I write in the book, uh, you know, there's, there's some quite personal stories about kind of the loss of my father and my you know, uh, son Jonah, who died uh, to stillbirth. stillbirth. Um, you know, taking the long view was not necessarily kind of the, the answer to some of those difficulties, but it did help me to, to kind of like see beyond the kind of like the difficulties in, in those moments. Uh, you know, it, it was a uh, one of the one of the kind of like the approaches that I tried to take was was to stand back from some of the, these 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 challenges. Uh, you know, I, I I won't do justice to them now. I'd encourage like people to read read it in the book. But like you know, I, I found that the long view gave me a kind of like uh, a sense of solace in, in in like some of my more difficult moments when I was drafting the book. And so that that's the that's the kind of like what I, the personal response. You know, I, I think there's many others, but yeah, that that's my own perspective now. The tagline of the book is we need to transform how the world sees time. Why is it important that we transform the way that we think about time right now? Well, in the 21st century, uh, we face a, a kind of a whole range of long term problems that climate change is the most obvious, but there are many others. There's antibiotic resistance. There's the rise of AI. There's the, the dangers that are posed by various different ex existential risks coming down the line. You know, at the same time, we're leaving behind legacies for future generations that could last for thousands of years. Think, think about how long nuclear waste lasts. You know, we, we, we're handing forward these malignant heirlooms to uh, the, the people that will come after us. Uh, we're, we're kind of shaping their, their whole kind of like lives through the things that we're doing right now in this century. Uh, this is something that like our predecessors weren't able to do you know nuclear power stations didn't exist in the medieval age so it, we have a unique kind of responsibility to hand forward a world that is not degraded by our acts in these few decades at the beginning of the 21st century now i, I think i think this is what uh, i decided to write the book to, to kind of tackle like the, this this sense that uh we face long-term problems that, that kind of like will affect people over the next few centuries and yet we've never been so short-termist you know we have these this kind of like this focus on the now there's this sense that we're always in the present and yet uh, the consequences of what we do over the next few decades will ripple ahead into the deep future so do you think that we are at this point in time in some kind of hinge of history that is a term that some philosophers have used to describe the kind of the, the state we're in now. So you can trace it back to a philosopher called Derek Parfit. You know, he you, you mentioned the the hinge of history as a, as a kind of like pivotal turning point in our species development. And other philosophers more recently, like Will McCaskill, have kind of looked at whether that's plausible or not. I wrote an article for the BBC about the hinge of history. Um, I mean, I mean, it, it's debatable about whether this is for example, the most important century, the most pivotal century. Um, there's a lot of, the, of discussion and argument about whether that is true or not. I mean, how can we know it's true because the future could be just as pivotal or, or, or more so? Um, however, it is, it is true that we, we face uh, risks that we've never faced before. You know, so there's always been a baseline level of background risk like the risk of an asteroid striking or or the risk of a super volcano you know the, the the natural disaster type of risks have always been there for humanity but over the past hundred years we've invented so many other things that could completely end everything that we know you know the, the nuclear bomb 
the the potential for AI to, to kind of get out of control. That these these are new, you know, bioengineered pathogens. Is it, that's a particularly scary one, you know. That they're, they're not uh, something that our predecessors had to face. And so, while it may not be the most pivotal hinge of history moment in our entire kind of like species development, it's certainly a, a very kind of important century in terms of what we do and where we end up. You touched on uh, Derek Parfit and uh, and that branch of long-termist uh, engagement with the future, seeing that the far future being uh, there's something that we is, is so overwhelmingly large that we need we're morally obliged to uh, to direct up and prioritise those uh, future possible people. And you and you speak about that uh, at length in the book. Um, I just wonder, could you just set out a little bit about what that long term what long termism is, and where does that fit within the long view? And uh, and how you see those two things as similar and perhaps different? Yeah, great. Thank. You. It's good to talk about this because I do I do think uh, there is a difference between long termism, the philosophy, and taking the long view or being long minded. So long termism is uh, a a term for a philosophy that's a, maybe about ten years old. It emerged in the effective altruism movement. So. Uh, the, there were there a group of people who wanted to work out ways to prioritize their actions within their lifetime in terms of doing the most good. So it began with, for example, looking at ways to spend uh, kind of charitable philanthropic funds. So if, if you wanted to kind of like donate a thousand dollars, for example, where is the best kind of most impactful way of donating that, that money? And the, the early conclusions were things like, well, you should donate malarial bed nets uh, to the developing world. You know, you're, you're more likely to save a life by donating your kind of charitable funds there than you might be in the, you know, the US. Um, over time, however, like the, the, the kind of dimension of time itself started to be considered within this, this kind of movement. You know, looking at kind of like future generations, if you include their needs and desires into kind of these calculations, there are so many of them you know, there could be potentially 100 trillion people living in the future that that the scale the sheer scale of of, of their kind of existence and those lives kind of add a, a kind of new moral urgency to the present according to these philosophers so there's one thing to know is that there are different types of long-termism that there's there's so-called weak long-termism which is kind of like the the kind of the, the general view that it should be a moral priority of our time to care about future generations but you can you can go up the kind of like the spectrum into other kind of more kind of extreme versions they, they get quite controversial there's one for example called strong long-termism now this is much more kind of like uh, strict much more kind of uh, demanding this suggests that doing the right thing by future people is the number one moral priority of our time now, not everybody agrees with that because that starts to go down strange, unusual paths where you start to kind of weigh the value of all future lives in the future against all the people living today. And so if there's 100 trillion people living in the future, but only 8 billion living today, then you might start to think, OK, well, I should start to make some strange decisions about like where my priorities lie. And so effective altruists themselves call this the, the train to crazy town which is, is a kind of way of describing how a philosophy could lead to uh, neglect in the present, potentially, you know, of, of kind of like people's needs or suffering or, or the problems that we face today, or, or even kind of like harms, you know, a, a greater good argument where the, the kind of the a harm done in the present could benefit, if it benefited future generations or slightly reduce the probability of a existential disaster in a thousand years time then a, a very strong kind of crazy town long-termist might say well that, that's worth doing and that's where it gets controversial not everybody agrees that long-termism is a good idea and there's been quite a lot of pushback over the past 12 months or so when i wrote my book uh the chapter on long-termism you know i was writing roughly in 2021 and had the chance to make some edits in 2022 
but all the things that have happened over the past six to, to 12 months in the, in the world of long-termism um, are kind of things that are relatively new. I, 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 I'm kind of, I wrote in the book that, you know, long-termism is on a kind of steep upward trajectory. It's, it's kind of billions of dollars are being kind of pushed into it. There's all sorts of kind of like controversial things that could kind of like spin out from this, this theory. So every, everything in the book is, is accurate, but like it's such a fast changing kind of like field that, uh, I, I you know you have to kind of run fast to keep up. So I, I, I've got a recent piece in Vox, uh, which kind of like updates my my kind of this, uh, approach to long termism. That in a nutshell, though, I see long termism as one of many different long views that one might consider or adopt. So I, I'm not a long termist myself, but I think there are interesting ideas in this field that are kind of worth taking note of. But it's not uh, a kind of philosophy that I fully sign up to. Uh, myself. Do you feel that uh, the attention and controversy that it's uh, attracted, does that how's that affected the the discussion for uh, your discussion about how to encourage people to take the long view? Well, where I think it's what what I don't want people to have to do is have to choose between the long term or the near term. So. You know, there's a, there's a, sometimes a question is raised in like long termist effective altruist circles of like, okay, so what's the opposite of long termism? And you know, so the, the term near termism sometimes gets used. And so, if you were a near termist, you would be more focused on uh, bed nets in in the developing world, or uh, you know, you'd be more focused on climate change because we're seeing the kind of the outcomes of that now in the present. Uh, you know, through wildfires, flooding, and, and so on not to mention social justice, inequality, and, so, and all these other kind of like near term issues. However, I, I kind of, I don't see it as a, as a kind of binary choice. You can be long-minded and present-minded at the same time, depending on kind of like the situation that you face. And so the, the, the downside of the long-termist approach is that it's built on a prioritization framework where you have to kind of like work out what are the world's most pressing problems and ra essentially rank them. Um, that that's not how I think, you know, I, and that's how not a, a lot of other people don't think either, you know. So I, I don't think you have to necessarily say that the long view is the most important issue at all times. Clearly, there are times when we need to a attend to problems in the present day, and if we all kind of acted for the long term all the time, then we would miss out on many of the things that matter right now. And so I, 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 what I don't want is people to think that long term thinking equals long termism and, and vice versa. I, th I think there are ways of uh, embracing a long view without kind of like getting kind of sucked into the, the discussions about whether we should balance the needs of present versus future day people. And I, I think there are, there are other ways, there are other, other kind of like approaches, like the artistic kind of like way of, of thinking about things, the, the kind of the indigenous, the, the religious, well, all the different long views that I write about in the, the last third of the book uh, are kind of alternatives that complement the, the kind of the, the long termism approach. Another uh philosophical uh, approach that uh, you feature in the book is is from Edmund Burke and you quote him as the, saying that society is indeed a contract a partnership not only between those that, who are living but those who are living those who are dead and those who are to be born and w what does that mean to you individually and perhaps what do you think that could mean in the context of building a deep civilization? Well, so, so Burke's kind of nice uh, small questions. Yeah, no, no, this is good. This is, I, I, this is it's a good question. Like, so, but Burke's uh, approach to kind of thinking about the the long term is is a an approach that I'm I'm personally quite drawn to. You know, I, I what, when I was thinking about my daughter's trajectory to the next century uh, early on in thinking about this book, that, you know, that's when I first came across uh, Edmund Burke's kind of writing on this and what uh, appeals about it to me is that it emphasizes the a duty to posterity you know the, the idea that that we are here because people before us made choices that led to our existence and therefore we have a kind of a duty a responsibility to do the right thing by the next generation and to, to pass the baton so as opposed to I mean there are some long views that take a kind of 
top-down population ethics view of you know the the past, present, and, and future. Whereas Burke's approach is is rooted in our generational ties. The you know the direct the person who came before us, you know the people who came before us, and, and then the people who will come after. You know it's it's person-centered, and I think that's that's what appeals to me about this approach. Like, but. But Burke also wrote about many other things, like the sublime, and I I, I th find that like the the approach of situating um, deep time and our responsibility to past and future generations in in the individual is something that uh, resonates a lot with me personally, and I and I see it manifest in in other ways as well so but burke wasn't the first person to say that that we have a duty to posterity there's there's kind of indigenous approaches that predate it um you know there's many other examples of, of this idea but you know I, I think he articulated in a particularly clear way for those individuals who are listening to this conversation and thinking okay well i'd like to start stretching my temporal horizons i'd like to take the long view um, what would you what would you signpost people towards or recommend to them uh, to help them expand their temporal horizons? The the short answer is that there are there are many different routes to the long view, and and so I I, I wouldn't prescribe any single route, and if different people have different values and different approaches, uh, you know. I, however, in, you know, in the book I write about, I mean, you mentioned Katie Patterson. I think that's a wonderful example of a um a, a, an artistic approach but also a community-led one so so katie patterson is a scottish artist who um a few years ago decided to start a library called the future library uh it's it's a uh, in oslo it's but in norway it, there is a forest that's growing where, where the the trees will be cut down in, in around 100 years time in order to print books that no one today apart from the authors themselves, has read. So Katie Patterson, the first author she asked to write a book was Margaret Atwood, uh, and then various other people like David Mitchell uh, and uh, Carl Oven Nausgaard. Like, uh, there's a whole list of authors and they're, they're building up one per year. And the manuscripts that they write are kind of expressly forbidden from being read. They won't be published until 2114 when, when when the trees will be cut down and the paper will be printed and the, the, the manuscripts will finally be available to future generations so no no one uh, can read these today but it's it's a lovely project it, uh, every year the authors go into the forest uh, i was there last may to see that kind of the the latest manuscripts being handed over um and what's clear is that there's a kind of community has, has, has like grown around that you know they like the the core um like uh, Anna Beata Hovind calls it the Future Library family, but there's also kind of like a, a, a kind of constellation of people surrounding it who, who go who go to the the ceremony. So through the forest you walk, like uh, you can kind of catch the, the the subway up north, like north of Oslo into the forest, and and like follow the authors as they they head out to kind of like the location where the manuscript is handed over to Katie. But like along the way, you know, you've got people carrying their children on their shoulders, like walking their dog, you know, that the mayor of Oslo is there walking too. It's like, it's, it's a, a way of connecting with future generations, but with many kind of like personal benefits and community led uh, kind of uh, kind of connections in, in the present, you know, it's clear that no one there will get to read the books, but, that that act of spending one Sunday morning a year thinking about the future and art and literature and what who might come after us like is fulfilling in so many other different ways and that 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 for me is is a great project that captures how to access long term time uh, without making it cold you know it's it's a warm approach to it and I, I love it. If you if you look at the the, the current uh, issues that we face around the world in terms of cost of living crisis, uh, inflation, there's a lot of pressures on individuals, and we mentioned earlier about uh, this sort of sense of role in crisis that we're kind of lurching between, and that can be on a personal level as much as a, at a, a country level, and. What do you say to those who who might who might take the view that seeking the long view is a, a privilege afforded to those whose lives and surroundings are secure? Yeah, I think that's a fair question, and I, I you know I tried I tried to kind of acknowledge that point within the book because um, clearly when you are kind of 
am in the middle of personal difficulty crisis uh, when you don't have enough to put uh, food on the table it's it's you know it feels almost callous to, to suggest that we should be thinking about the very long term it is some long-term thinking is sometimes seen as a predilection of for the for the elite you know who are comfortable who, who can do it um, and certainly there are some approaches like that that do you, you know do I, I, I think it is a fair criticism, however, when the likes of Burke talks about kind of like the, the generations that are closest to us, you know, I, I, I do think that that's one way, one route towards the long view. So asking people to, to embrace a technocratic kind of long view of how society should be built is, is maybe not for everybody, but then that's just one way of kind of approaching the long view. So when I think about like my relationship with my parents and my relationship with my daughter, that's that for me is the start of a, a kind of process of thinking about like how my family ties stretch across time. We all have families, you know. So I think that's that that's one way to approach the long view. I, th I think clearly, uh, I, you know, I, I've, I've I live a relatively privileged life. You know, I, I'm kind of. Uh, compared with many people on planet Earth, I'm, I'm like you know in the, the top one percent of richest people, right? So it's, it's it's something that like not everybody can ac access at all times, um, but the I, I think you see in communities across time the the sense that we have a link with people who came before us and the, who and people who come after us. I think that can be universal. That's that's accessible to everybody, not at all times of their life. But at some point, I think it's clear that this matters. This is a basic human kind of uh, need approach uh, to, to kind of community, past, present and future. And perhaps we do, do we see that played out in, in ways that aren't perhaps articulated as we're going to sit down and think about the future, but actually through uh, rituals and customs and traditions that actually those acts embody an element of what you've just dis described but aren't spoken of in terms of using the, the lexicon of long-term uh, long-term long thinking yeah that's true i mean it's a, i mean i just it, sometimes when I, you know you talk about the future it just conjures up an idea in your head of of kind of science fiction or um kind of like you know cold blue kind of existences and you know but the thing is i think that, that, that's why you know you know in my book, I talk about attitudes towards time. You know, it's a f the future is part of that, but it's I prefer to see it as like the long arc of time and our place on that that kind of trajectory. You know, so so I think when you I mean when you mention about kind of um, religious and indigenous approaches, like yes, you you can you can look at um, how certain ideas uh, have been passed forward over the long term, carried on the. The, the back of rituals and traditions. So, you know, I, I kind of I, one part of the book that I, I found really interesting to research was was kind of about the the way that the things that we we do. So, so if you want to kind of like pass forward an idea to future generations, or you know, you, there's many ways you can do it. Like one approach you know, is to to kind of like to build something or to make something or leave it behind. You know, build a statue to something and hope that it gets it's pass, passed on. However, you know, when you look at the, the kind of religions and approaches and, and cultural practices that have existed for thousands of years, often there's no physical kind of uh, existence for those. They, they exist based on the links between people, like the, the rituals that are practiced over time, you know, the, 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 the repetition and, and the, the way that people come together as a community. And, and often that is a form of long mindedness, which is not necessarily about you know future things and and you know future people and science fictional things it's about you know how to make things last and endure and uh, so you know i think the long rituals long traditions are something that i've tried to think about and embed in my kind of like daily life where, where possible you know and, and also you know recognize that in in others too so you know i, I think that, that that's just one example of the way that uh the long, the long view can be about so much more than than just us situated in the present looking into the future what way do you think uh 
you've your thinking about time has transformed or changed throughout the course of researching and, and writing this book well so so i started at the beginning like with the problem as in so a reflection on my daughter's trajectory into the future but then quickly coming up against kind of like the uh, the issues of, of short-termism. You know, the, the, I wrote a BBC article back in 2019. It was called, you know, The Perils of Short-Termism, Civilization's Greatest Threat. You know, it, and it was looking at all, all the kind of like the, the problems that we face in the 21st century from climate change to, to existential risk and, and thinking about how do we solve that? How do, how do we step out of the, the now to take a longer view? But then I spent the past, past five years speaking to many kind of long-minded individuals, organizations, and, and looking at various different approaches to take the long view. And I guess along the way, my perspective shifted from worry and concern to something more positive and more hopeful. So, you know, I, I kind of discovered that the long view can offer a sense of perspective when, when things are kind of in upheaval. You know, I, I realized that the, the long view can offer a kind of compass direction, you know, when, when things are confusing, you know, and there's also a sense of hope that it comes with it, you know. So the when you take a kind of like long perspective of time, you can see that many things are getting worse, but you can also see that things, some things are getting the better. Or, and, and also you can also see that, that there is the opportunity for things to get better than we can currently imagine, you know. So that there are, there are kind of, the long view offered me has offered me a lens on the world that has changed how I see it. You know, it allows me to kind of like see the possibilities that the future is plural, that there are many paths ahead, and we ought to be careful not to take the bad ones. But there are potentially many good paths too, and I think that that's that's the big great benefit of the long view for me. So looking at the book, it's it's got some really great um, stories and vignettes in there. Is there a favourite that you have from the book that you'd like to share with us? Um, yeah, there's, there's one uh, which, so in, 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 the, in the, the kind of, the chapter that's about like how we developed our sense of mental time travel, you know, so I, I write about um, how we can transport our minds from the, the past into the future. Um, a lot of the researchers have looked at kind of like the question of well, are, you, are human beings unique uh, in that, that skill? You know, can animals do it? Um, and one of the, the most kind of like interesting, but also notorious kind of stories is, is that of Santino, the chimpanzee. So yeah, the, the, there was a chimpanzee in, in Sweden, in, in the zoo, in Furovik, uh, who one day, researchers noticed, started to make these curious little piles of stones and so behind a log or ne you know next to the the viewing kind of platform he in the morning he would like uh, go and collect kind of stones and he would also chip away at kind of the concrete on the, on the outside of the enclosure and, and to kind of get fragments and then just create these little piles and they were, you, you know you see in the research paper like little arrows pointing out where, where he'd hidden them and so initially the zookeepers were kind of a bit puzzled by that why is he doing that uh, it became apparent when the visitors filed in and went up to the barrier to look at like Santino's enclosure, he would ambled over, picked up the fragments and just started chucking them into the crowd. Uh, and so it was very mischievous kind of like naughty thing that then, so they had to take Santino inside and say, you know, say naughty Santino, please don't do that. Right. The, what is interesting <laughs> about that example for researchers is that it seemed to be an example of forward planning. So Santino, clearly had a sense that uh, he would get pleasure or joy or whatever it was that was going through his, his head when he was throwing the, the kind of the, you know, he, he was imagining his future self. And that, that's something that researchers are not quite sure whether animals can do. You know, so there's some evidence from kind of like scrub jays, a type of bird, for example, that they kind of like store things away for future use. Or, but it's, it's unclear whether the, the behavior is automatic or whether it's an actual actual planning. And so that, that was one of my favorite stories. I mean, it, Santino is, uh, is, is, is like sadly has is, 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 is died now, but he, well, whilst he was alive, he was a very interesting kind of isolated example of possible mental time travel in the animal kingdom. 
And uh, I think I think that that kind of question of whether human beings have that ability uniquely or not is still being debated. But I think Santino kind of uh, mixed it up a bit with his with his stone throwing. So I like that story. Excellent, excellent. And um, and so, uh, how have people have reacted when you told them that you were writing a book about long term thinking. Uh, it depends who you Just ask, curious. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it depends who you ask. I mean, to a, to a non long term thinking person. Um, I think I think I, g- generally one thing that I've, I've seen from having conversations with people is that everyone recognises the the problems of short term thinking. You know, so you know, I speak to my brother who's a nurse in the NHS, or you know, my, my wife who's a teacher in the education sector. Like, I think I think. You know, an old school friend got in touch the other day. Uh, you know, who now works in the civil service in, in UK politics, and it, it's possible to kind of like see the problem in all these different sectors. And so, people want to, to to kind of like find ways out of it, but they tend to be often kind of isolated within their kind of you know their particular sector or environment. They, they, you know, people can see the problem, but they can't see how to connect with others who might be like-minded. And so I, I, the book, uh, I think, I would hope, like, would act as a, a vector to allow people to kind of connect with one another. You know, so if, if you were working in politics, there might be things to le- learn from the world, world of business and or the world of education. And I think that that kind of, uh, those com- kind of conversations that I've had along the way, uh, you know, I've, I've tried to kind of meet as many kind of like long-minded people as possible. But it's, it's striking to me that even within the world of like long term thinking, not everybody is connected up. So the artists don't speak to the philosophers who don't speak to the technologists, you know, so I think just the act of, of kind of like connecting people who have shared the same belief that, that kind of a long view matters, I think is something that I tried to do in the book. And I hope that's the kind of like what, what will come next with it. You know that ability to connect. I mean, that's that's why you and me are talking now, right? As in, we're, we're both interested in it, but we come from completely different backgrounds, and so I, I think that that's one of the great joys of writing a book like this. You meet and come across people who you wouldn't speak to otherwise, who have interesting stories to tell and interesting backgrounds to bring to the question. Thank you ever so much for uh, for this really interesting conversation we've had, a thorough conversation, and uh, there's a lot more in the book, and it is available right now in all good bookshops and i implore you to have a look and just once again to say thank you very much for your time today richard thank you thanks for having me